Which pretty much you, you already know your husband's dead. Is he dead? Yes. Okay. Our story begins in the city of Placerville, California. Just after 6 p.m., El Dorado County 911 receives an unusual call. 911, what's the location of your emergency? Uh, my name's David Weiner. I'm an attorney, and uh, the address of the emergency is Wilderness Court. And there's been a there's a dead body there. Okay, what happened? Yeah, I, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm an attorney. I, I'm just relaying in, uh, information that I received. Now, now, who killed who? Don't know. I just want to report this and get somebody out there. The attorney stated that he was at his office in Cameron Park and not at the scene. He refused to answer most other questions. Multiple units from the El Dorado Sheriff's Department rushed to the scene. Based on the information gathered from the 911 call, the deputies were responding to what was at most a homicide or at the least a natural death. They had no idea what they were about to walk into. When they arrived at the residence, they established a perimeter. The officers at the front of the house see a woman moving around in the house acting as if nothing was wrong. The officers on the scene requested that dispatch call the residents in order to get a hold of the female inside. Not knowing the situation going on inside the residence, they didn't want to knock down the door or possibly alert someone inside that may have been holding the woman hostage. Eventually, dispatch was able to get the woman to come to the door and exit the house. She identifies herself as 70-year-old Colleen Harris. She informs the officers that her husband, 72-year-old Bob Harris, is in bed. Put a blanket over and saw what he looked like. Okay. You didn't check the pulse or anything like that. I just need to know if I need medics to show up here. One of the officers at the scene stated that when Colleen looked at him, it was as if she was looking straight through him, like she wasn't talking to him. The officer believed that she wasn't in a right state of mind. She then looked at him and said, you have to go see him, referring to her husband. He's beautiful. Colleen remained outside while a team of officers cautiously enters the home. They begin clearing the house. After walking down a long hallway and reaching the last bedroom, the officers find a scene that is anything but beautiful. There was blood on the walls. The bed is made, but there appears to be a person completely covered head to toe with sheets. Walking closer to the bed, they find a double-barreled shotgun sitting on top of the blankets. Officers slowly approach and pull back the blanket slightly to reveal what turned out to be Robert Harris. There was no mistaking that Robert could not be saved. There appeared to be a gunshot wound to the side of his face. The officers lower their weapons and call for detectives. You know those annoying promotional mailers you receive from every credit card company known to man? Well, with the sponsor of today's video, Aura, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to get those junk mailers forever. With Aura, your name, address, and phone number are proactively removed from telemarketing and mailing lists. This is just one of the many features Aura has to offer. Aura is the one-stop solution to financial identity and digital security. Aura offers a suite of features, there are too many to name them all, but the ones that stand out to me as the reasons why I use their service are their social security number and personal information monitoring, as well as their credit monitor. With our ever-increasing digital footprint, it's great to have Aura watching your back. Add Aura to your cyber defense arsenal today with a 14-day free trial using the top link in the description or in the pinned comment. If for some reason you don't love the service, you can cancel any time within the 14-day trial period and pay nothing. You have nothing to lose, so start your free trial today at Aura.com slash Crimetastic. This is also a great way to help support the channel. And don't worry, I will remind you about Aura at the end of the video so you can keep on watching. Once detectives arrive, they quickly try to size up whether or not this is a self-inflicted death or a homicide. Detectives examine the gun laying next to Bob on the bed. It was a pistol-gripped, sawed-off shotgun. The gun was down fairly low towards his feet and not within reach of his hands. A closer inspection of the gunshot wound to Bob's head reveals a large entry and gunpowder residue that would indicate that the end of the weapon that was used was several inches away from his head. The position of the shotgun on the bed and the weapon not being pressed against the head when fired left detectives with no doubt that this was a homicide. In the minutes that followed, Bob's family members were contacted. Robert Bob Harris was born on February 3, 1940. Growing up in the Bay Area, Bob studied engineering at UC Berkeley. He used his degree to turn his passion for the outdoors into a paycheck. 
Bob worked for the U.S. Forest Service. He became the administrator for the Lake Tahoe region, which his colleagues regarded as the most coveted position in the entire U.S. Forest Service. For many years, Bob focused on his career in raising three kids with his first wife. But when the kids left home, Bob's marriage came to an end. According to family members, the divorce hit the family pretty hard, but Bob continued to be a good father to his children. He found himself enjoying the life of a bachelor. That is until, in the late 80s, he reconnected with an old friend, Colleen Batten. They originally met when they were in middle school and had a relationship. Like Bob, Colleen was also single with grown children. In 1985, she was widowed when she lost her first husband, Jim Batten, a prominent land surveyor. Colleen took over her deceased husband's surveying business. Jim Batten had a property portfolio worth roughly $1 million. She successfully ran that company for a number of years. She was fairly well off when she met Bob Harris. The two called each other and began to talk, and soon after started dating. Bob was attracted to Colleen's can-do spirit. She had built a Mercedes engine in the living room of her house without the instruction manual. She was really bright with an engineering mind. After dating for four years, they married on September 2nd, 1990 and moved into Colleen's Placerville home. The couple was well known and respected. After two decades together, the hardworking couple retired. They spent their newfound freedom giving back. Bob was a volunteer at the sheriff's department. He was a man who was deeply involved in his community. By all accounts, they were happy. By 2013, Bob and Colleen had been together for nearly 30 years. But on January 6th, their life together comes to a sudden and bizarre end. After El Dorado investigators rule out suicide, they check in with Colleen who is outside the home with officers. She was seated in the back of one of the patrol vehicles and was very cooperative. However, she seemed to have no emotion. She may have been having a dissociative moment because of what she had just experienced. Detectives inform her that she was going to be taken to the station for an interview. While Colleen is on her way to the sheriff's department, detectives try to make sense of the horrifying scene inside the home. The victim was completely under the blankets and appeared to be in sleeping attire. There was a large hole to the left side of his head near the cheek area that carried on through the skull and out the right side of the head. Detectives find some indications that Bob's death had not occurred recently. The blood was congealed, rigor mortis had set in, and he was cold to the touch. It appeared as if several hours had passed since his death. The rest of the house is untouched. The windows were all secure, the doors were secure, and it didn't appear that anybody had tried to break into the home. Investigators head to the sheriff's office where they meet up with Colleen in an interview room. During the interview, she puts her feet up on an empty chair. She appears to be very calm and relaxed as they question her. Detectives obviously want to know what happened that evening, but Colleen can't recall anything that happened that day. So, um, what happened to that coin? You know. I remember um, taking down Christmas decorations and they were watching a movie. They asked Colleen why her attorney dialed 911 to report Bob's death and she claimed to not know. She remembered nothing until deputies arrived. Colleen tells the detective that she does have one vague memory from the night. I remember seeing a gun. I saw my husband was bleeding. What was your first thought? I thought maybe he was having a nosebleed. He gets a lot of nosebleeds. And was he actively bleeding? I just saw just a little bit of blood on, on the pillow area. Colleen said that she had put a blanket over Bob's head because he had a nosebleed. Investigators found that rather strange, because having been at the crime scene, it could not anywhere remotely be confused with a nosebleed. Colleen attempts to explain her lack of memory. Um, you talked about a gray fog. Yeah. Uh, it's just like I'm... I don't know, it's like, I, like everything around me is like in a kind of a shadow. Okay. Because it seems like you've, you've lost pretty much all of today and part of last night. I have, and I don't know why. Then the interview takes yet another bizarre turn. Which pretty much you, you already know your husband's dead. Yes, he's dead? Yes. Got him killed? 
Stunned, investigators take a different track. They let Colleen talk about whatever topic she wanted. She told them that her and Bob's relationship was great. And I didn't want to love her so Colleen's behavior stumps investigators. Was she truly experiencing psychogenic amnesia, or was this all a facade? Then investigators get some alarming news. They find out that Colleen had been responsible for the death of her first husband. In 1985, Colleen's first husband, Jim Batten, was also murdered. The case involved Colleen, a gun, the same house, in fact, the same room. The police still had the recording of the 911 call from 1985. Jim was also found dead, lying in bed with a gunshot wound. Colleen also claimed to have been suffering from amnesia in that case. She was arrested at the scene and immediately charged with Jim Batten's murder. The attorney who represented her during that trial was attorney David Weiner, the same attorney that made the 911 call to report Bob Harris's death. Five months after Jim Batten's death, Colleen went on trial for his murder. At the trial, she seemed to have recovered memories from the day Jim was killed. After working with a psychologist, Colleen testified that on the day of the murder, she confronted Jim with divorce papers because he reportedly mal their daughter. She alleged that the discussion escalated into a physical confrontation. Colleen claimed that Jim began to assault her and that he had put a gun to her head. A struggle ensued, but she managed to get the gun from Jim's hands. She shot and killed him in self-defense. At trial, the defense was able to make Jim Batten out to be a sex predator, and Colleen was motivated by the terrible things he'd done. According to court records, while Colleen opted not to press charges against Jim Batten when the assaults occurred, her daughter always maintained that he was guilty of molest. In the end, Colleen Batten was acquitted of Jim's murder. Armed with this new information, El Dorado County investigators head back to the interview room to confront Colleen about Jim's death. Is your second husband? Yeah. Okay. I did. How did he die? He... What did he die of? Um, he was a, a child mother. And he ended up dying. And when it comes to details, once again, Colleen's memory fails her. You don't remember what that was or the circumstances around that? I think it's so long ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Detectives continue to hold Colleen in the interview room as they keep digging. The investigators make contact with family members for more information. Investigators learn that Bob and Colleen's marriage had been on the rocks for some time, largely because Colleen was convinced that Bob was having an affair with a woman in Mongolia. Has your husband seen somebody else in another country? Yeah, he has been. It took me four hours, but I got into his computer and I found uh, some conversation that he had had with her. The woman Bob was allegedly interested in was about 40 years old, while Bob was 72. Whether the affair was real or not, Colleen claims that it didn't bother her. He said, you're the most perfect wife anybody could ever want. He said, I don't know why I did what I did. He said, and I, I'm working on it. And I said, and I love you unconditionally. Despite Colleen's explanations, detectives are skeptical. Bob's death was similar in many ways to Jim's back in 1985. They had enough probable cause to arrest Colleen at that point. Before Colleen heads to the county jail, detectives request that she gets checked out at a local hospital. While under observation, Colleen seems to have her cognitive function and memory intact. Medical personnel alert detectives to some concerning physical injuries. Colleen had an abrasion in the middle of her chest and an injury to one of her fingers. Both injuries are consistent with her having held the sawed-off shotgun and having it pushed back violently and striking her in the chest. Autopsy results confirm Bob's cause of death. His body showed early stages of decomposition, meaning Bob had not died recently but many hours before 911 was called. Hoping to get more details of the timeline, investigators reach out to the man who made the initial 911 call, Colleen's former defense attorney, David Weiner. 
Detectives soon learned he did more than just call the police that day. He had met with Colleen at the crime scene for about an hour and a half before he went to his office and made the 911 call. Weiner maintains that he never entered the home. He said that he remained in the driveway and met with Colleen inside of his vehicle. He refused to answer any further questions. Weiner, being Colleen's defense attorney, did not want the obvious conflict of becoming a witness in the case against his client. Investigators push forward, continuing to build their case. They reach out to Bob's daughter, 47-year-old Pam Sterling, who agrees to come in for an interview. The first thing she brought up was Colleen being a homicide suspect in 1985 and that both her father and she knew about it. Like Colleen, Pam mentions the infidelity but says that Colleen was extremely upset that Bob might be having an affair. So much so that it had driven Bob to seek a divorce in September 2012. Colleen was texting Pam asking why Bob was leaving her and if he was in love with someone else. In one string of texts, Colleen is very hopeful that she and Bob are going to get back together. In the next one, she's despondent about Bob leaving her and about their relationship ending. Two months later, Colleen convinced Bob to come back to the family home, at least temporarily. Colleen was scheduled to have hip surgery and she needed someone to help her. Bob moved back in, but he stated that upon her recovery, he was going to move to Tahoe to his second home and end their relationship. The night before the murder, Bob was at the Placerville home when Pam received the last text message she would ever get from Colleen. During that last exchange, Colleen indicated that she had caught Bob on the phone with his girlfriend from Mongolia. Pam said Colleen was very concerned with Bob being on the phone with this woman. Colleen never mentioned anything to investigators about Bob leaving her. With search warrants in hand, detectives went back to the residence and found a series of handwritten journals that were Colleen's. They claimed to have started in 1985. She portrays herself in the journals as a faithful, loving wife whose husband Bob is mistreating her, but that she forgives him. There are aspects of the journal entries that would suggest they're fabricated. The entries were not in chronological order. Journal entries claiming to be from years prior were found after more recently dated entries. Investigators strongly believed that they were written retrospectively. This would indicate a high level of planning. It would have taken months of preparation to fill that many years worth of journals. Detectives keep digging. They get a search warrant for Colleen's cell phone records. The results of the cell phone records were alarming. In the hours after the investigators believed Bob was murdered, they traced Colleen's movements. During her interview, Colleen claimed that she never left the house on Wilderness Way on the weekend of the murder. However, detectives found that her cell phone traveled from the Wilderness Way address all the way down Highway 50 to Highway 80 and to the Bay Area. Records show that following Bob's murder, Colleen made the three-hour drive to San Francisco, arriving at around 10 a.m. On her way home, she makes a stop because her car broke down, and because of that, she places a call to AAA to ask for a tow truck. Detectives were able to get the recording of that call with AAA. Thank you for calling AAA. This is Diane. May I have your name, please? Uh, Colleen Harris. Yes, Miss Harris. Are you in a safe location? Yeah, I did a complete circle on the freeway. Luckily, nobody was behind me or on the side of me. Yeah. I don't know what happened. But the car won't start. I'm off of Highway 80. I can see a sign ahead of me that says, UC Davis, Sacramento. I live in Tuxedo, so I have no way to get home unless you know, I have the car. Okay. So, and I don't have anybody at home, so I'm just going to have to wait. On the call, Colleen was very articulate. She stated where she was, what she needed, and how to get there. There doesn't seem to be any confusion. This was just the information detectives needed to confirm that her claim of amnesia was false. Now investigators want to know where Colleen was headed and why. They found that Colleen's phone pinged off of a tower that was near her adult son's residence in San Francisco. After finding this information, they attempted to contact her son, Wesley Thornberry. Initially, Wesley said he didn't have any contact with his mother on Sunday, January 6th. However, Wesley tells investigators that his mother did try to call him that morning. She said that she was in the Bay Area and was hoping to meet up with him. Wesley insisted that he never actually met up with her. It was later confirmed that he was having brunch with his fiancée. 
Detectives take a closer look at Colleen and Bob's finances, and they stumble across something that sparks their interest. Colleen and Bob had actually divorced for about a year in 2004. The divorce was done so that Colleen could take advantage of some financial death benefits from her former husband, Jim Batten. She received his survivor benefits, which amounted to roughly $1,100 a month. Colleen and Bob had remarried after she had been able to secure those benefits. This proved how keenly focused Colleen was on finances. Investigators learned that Colleen could expect another payday following Bob's death. Bob had a long career and a pension. They were well off with an estate worth approximately a million dollars. As detectives are collecting evidence of Colleen's motives, they get a strange call from David Weiner. The attorney stated that he had some possessions that were given to him that he felt he needed to turn over to law enforcement. He had some property that belonged to Bob Harris, and it included a large coin collection. Detectives subsequently learned that those items were brought to him by Colleen Harris's son, Wesley. Wesley claimed that he found the items in his garage after his mother had been arrested for the murder of Bob Harris. The coin collection was worth around $30,000. On March 17, 2015, the trial for Bob's murder begins. Colleen claims that she moved the coin collection so that it wouldn't be stolen. However, investigators and the prosecution believe that she was at one point planning to use the missing coins to stage the scene as a robbery, and that said robber must have killed her husband. They believe that Colleen had shifting ideas about how she planned on getting away with Bob's murder, leading her to abandon the staged robbery. Prosecutors lay out a timeline of events leading up to Bob's murder. Colleen and Bob had dinner on Saturday night and watched some television. Bob, at some point, must have disclosed that his plan was to drive back to his residence the next day. The moment she snapped was knowing that he was going to leave. With Bob set to leave the next morning, Colleen came up with a plan. She waited until he was asleep. She went into the bedroom with a sawed-off shotgun, leaned across the bed, and shot him at near point-blank range, killing him instantly. Colleen then spent the next several hours plotting her defense. One of her ideas was trying to clean up the crime scene. However, she pretty quickly abandoned the idea because it was overwhelming. Instead, Colleen called the same man who helped her back in 1985, defense attorney David Weiner. She called her lawyer from the crime scene, and then he called the police. She met with him hours before law enforcement was notified. In court, the defense presents multiple defenses, that it was a suicide, an accident, self-defense, or amnesia. The recording of the call to AAA was compelling because the jury was able to hear, in Colleen's own voice, that she was aware of her surroundings, cognizant, and able to answer questions. The same as with the trial regarding her first husband, Colleen's memory miraculously came back. Colleen claimed at one point that Bob had assaulted her earlier that evening. She recalled that there was some sort of struggle in which she described being able to feel the shotgun with her hands. She said that Bob ended up taking control of the shotgun and accidentally fired the weapon, killing himself. Her claim was not supported by any of the crime scene evidence. After a five-week trial, it takes the jury less than two hours to reach a verdict. She was convicted of first-degree murder. She was also convicted of a special allegation of using a firearm in order to commit the murder, resulting in an overall sentence of 50 years to life. Even though Colleen finally ended up behind bars, Bob's family still grapples with what could have been. His children hope that his legacy will live on through his grandkids and that they will know the type of man he was and carry that with them. Colleen Harris died in prison in July of 2022 at the age of 80. Remember to check out Aura with the link in the description or in the pinned comment. For more videos of cases never before seen on YouTube, click one of the videos on screen now or the links in the pinned comment. Goodbye for now.